Hello, everyone. Welcome to Toast Tuesday. My name is Sierra McKissick, and I'm the Communications Associate at Oxbow. We're so glad to have you here for our second Toast Tuesday of our entire series. We've been doing this for our membership program, the Samson Club, which we started in 2020 to connect people to Oxbow, give them the opportunity to have awesome workshops, different kinds of anecdotes, special merch, and all kinds of things. We have a multitude of multitude of different levels for you to join as low as about $12 to as high as however much you can support this great institution that's been around for 111 years. Uh, we're really grateful to be able to have wonderful artists who are part of our community and as a part of our virtual programming that we've been trying to introduce we've been having conversations with those people in our communities. So artists, makers, thinkers, and people who have close ties to Oxbow. Toast Tuesday specifically is focused on our staff and they invite someone to be in conversation with them. So today we have Devin Ballara, our metal studio manager, who will be in conversation with Abigail Lucien, who is a wonderful artist and together they teach hard lines drawing with steel. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them before I hand it over for them to dive a bit deeper. So Devin Ballara hails from the aggressively pastel suburbs of Tampa, Florida. She received a BFA in sculpture from the University of North Florida in Jacksonville and an MFA in sculpture from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. She is a recipient of the 2014 Outstanding Student Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award, a full fellowship to the Vermont Studio Center Residency Program, a residency at 8550 Ohio, and a curatorial assistantship with the building department at Elsewhere Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. I've always wanted to go there. National solo and group exhibitions include grounds for sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Jacksonville, Florida, Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati, Ohio, Project Space One in Iowa City, and the Indianapolis Art Center in Indiana. Abigail, Abigail Lucienne is an interdisciplinary artist raised in Cap Haitian, Haiti and Florida, Working in sculpture, poetry, video, and sound, their practice looks at ways cultural identities and inherited colonial structures transmit to the body and psyche by playfully challenging systems of assimilation through material. Lucienne was named the 2021 Forbes 30 Under 30 list and is the 2020 Harpo Emerging Artist Fellow. They hold a BFA from Florida State University and an MFA in printmaking from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Their work has exhibited at museums and institutions such as MoMA PS1, Atlanta Contemporary, UICA in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Museum of Fine Arts in Tallahassee, Florida, Woman Main Gallery in Chicago, as well as Vox Populi Gallery and the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia. Lucienne is currently based in Baltimore where they teach full-time in the Interdisciplinary Sculpture Department at MICA. And with that, I will hand it over to Devin and Abigail. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sierra, for introducing us. Um, thank you, Oxbow, for having us here. We are really excited. I'm going to do that really awkward moment to get my um, screen on and sharing. And we will begin in like a second. Let's see. Thanks everybody for coming. Hi. <laughs> uh, let's see. There you go. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah we can. Amazing. Just wanted to make sure. Um, great. Well, before we start, um, I wanted to just give us a moment. Hold on. I have. I'm like desktop queen um, of a million tabs going on right now. This is gonna be cute in just a second. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I'd like to begin our talk by taking a moment to humbly acknowledge the stolen and sacred land that we are both broadcasting from. Um, I am tuning in from the ancestral lands of the Piscataue people and the Nanakoke Lenape Lini tribal nation, uh, known colonially as Baltimore City. 
Um, and we are being hosted and Devin is broadcasting from Sagatok, Michigan, indigenously known as the ancestral lands of the Potawatomi tribe. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors of these places and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. Uh, in remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. As an active and ever learning part of my de decolonial practice and research, I am practicing this land acknowledgement to honor the historical and continuing connections between indigenous people and their native lands, as well as a means to recognize our historical and still continuing relationship to colonization in North America. So I invite each of you who are tuning in to take a moment to drop in the chat what native lands you are broadcasting from this afternoon um, as a gesture of echoing our respects. So you all have come here um, to <laughs> hear a little bit about me and Devin um, and uh, being hosted here at Oxbow is a way to also put a shameless plug to our class that we teach each summer um, or since I guess once, you know, it doesn't matter that we teach in the summer called Hard Lines, um, Drawing with Steel. Uh, so this is a little bit about our class. Um, it's a hybrid of um, a drawing practice and a metalworking practice, two types of working and processes that are both really dear to Devin and I's um, practice, but also to our hearts and the way that we think about work. Um, and so, We'll both touch on how this material and how this sort of process uh, folds into our work individually through this talk. Um, and we'll preface it a little bit with um, about 10 to 15 minutes each talking about our individual work to give you context. Um, and then we've prepared some questions for each other to kind of poke a little bit deeper into um, uh, the ways that we see each other's works um, as ways to maybe talk a little bit about how we see our own too. Mm. A sweet rot, a slow burn, charred rubber with a hint of lime, salt in your saliva, salt in your pussy, salt in your eye, an aroma of burning tires, a smoky recollection, a second wind, a face tan, a night swim. I consider my work to be autoethnographic from material to color to language to ideologies, the works really foreground my Haitian American heritage as a way of understanding and exploring inherited colonial structures, as well as systems of care. The island is always playing a character within the home, uh, the island breathing energy into a space absence of electricity. Uh, what does home, land, space, sound, feel, and smell like? Right, um, This space of my living room being a really contemplative space um, for me as both a child and as an adult, it's the result of what happens when you ask a six-year-old uh, how they would like their room designed, and they answer that they would like it in the shape of a circle. And so the steel bars of our home um, have had this uh, adjustment to have this like circular space to be shaped to um, my whims. I would say that this is my first ideological steel sculpture <laughs> in some sort of way. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, uh, in the intersection of belief and faith and myth and how these things are used to create symbols of power. Um, when thinking of these notions of historical power um, and representations of power, uh, my research is always returning back to this portrait of Louise de Carrel. Uh, her black page is holding a piece of coral in one hand and on the other hand, a shell of pearls over her ovaries, right? This depiction of the supposed adoration and reinforcement of control and power and ownership she has over both the land and the materials possessions represent, the, the material possessions represent, and it's people represented by her young page, right? So I'm curious about how we can sort of dissect these historical um, images of power to understand how they have trickled into our everyday ways of dissect, or dissect, dissect, 
dissecting, <laughs> dissecting um, the, the structures and the systems around us. And, and how those systems are sort of um, embedded with these places of, of belief and faith, right? So sometimes these like ideas of, um, or these phenomenons of belief and faith, they happen in these like small everyday moments too. Um, this uh, this um, last January, not uh, 2020, right? Um, I was on a residency in New Mexico and I lost uh, about like six months of studio work and like a grand of studio supplies just to like sending it in the mail. And when I was about to give up on like this entire work, I um, I did that. I was like doing this illegal U-turn um, at some like random place in New Mexico and found this block, the block that I had like nailed to myself, like on the side of the road. I like skrr and like grabbed it. <laughs> um, I actually made my friend who was driving the car. I was like, get out right now, go get that block right now because I was driving. Um, but uh, I, I ended up returning it at the end of my residency. And I wrote this letter um, to whoever the owners was who says, dear you, thanks for letting me borrow your block without asking. You've no idea the hope it's brought to me. Here she is safe and sound and now living on in silicone and butter with gratitude and love a visiting artist. Um, there is this sort of type of way that I think about working as an interdisciplinary artist. There are many forms my work takes and they don't really neatly fit into definable boxes, but rather flu fluidly actualize in tandem with one another. Um, so a sculpture begins as a poem and then it becomes a performance and to later become a print that turns into an object um, and so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes these objects are casted through found blocks um, and other times are, are found objects and other times they're replicated from scratch. Uh, so these blocks are inspired by my grandfather's building in Pion, um, that was once a church, now a school, forever a community haven. Uh, and through the, the material translation of these objects, I'm asking um, for a deeper understanding of the places built and the lands occupied, as well as implicating the bodies and relationships to materials and places, right? So here I, um, I'm, I'm still sort of poking out this like notion of care within architecture, um, pouring acetone to eat away this like CNC carved foam negative and reveal the, the cement block I've casted. In, um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, in my current studio research, I'm, I've been probing this intimacy within the labor of self-care. So as a result, the, the one sort of su supporting materials in my sculpture, such as coconut oil and soap and shea and cocoa butter, um, they've all taken this um, sort of falling to the, or I guess like rising to the top in this like increasingly more intrinsic part of the processes that I work with. Merging this um, architectural vernacular, right, um, with this interest in highlighting this tenderness and this labor and this ritual, really, of, of self care. Uh, and so through them, I'm, I'm exploring these systems of these objects by investigating these intersections of race and labor and commerce uh, and how they relate to these spaces of seen and unseen systems of care and who's allowed to really have those spaces of wellness during um, this time and, and who have traditionally been able to take these spaces of wellness. Um, one can uh, spot this uh, symbol in my work a lot, this inverted heart shape. Um, you can also see it in, um, in the ironwork in Haiti and, and elsewhere. Uh, this shape is often associated with the idea of the Sankova, um, this, which means to go back and get it and twee. It's meant to look like a swan-like bird grasping for an egg that holds it, uh, this like egg on its back. Um, it's a symbol that represents the need to reflect on the past to be truly and fully present to build on a fruitful future. Uh, the inverted heart is also um, the inverted heart is also uh, a simplified motif or um, of a vive, which is a cosmogram used in uh, representation of a loa, which or a spirit um, during voodoo rituals. Um, 
I'm also using metal as um, I, I think something that's similar between the way that Devin and I work with metal is that we're thinking about it as a drawing tool. Um, but I'm also using it as a way to address these unseen systems and hidden forces at, at play in our day to day life. Uh, the significance um, of iron and bronze in my work really centers around gestures of recording of memory tools and sites of recollection. Uh, so playing upon lore surrounding tying mnemic knots, uh, their purpose to be to call up or a recollection or to give it a body to render it active and thereby actual. Um, I'm enacting this gesture of rendering memory permanent through metal. By, by utilizing these forms, I'm curious, I, I wonder like how we might tie down a fleeting memory, um, how with, with a knot, um, does that really actually work? Um, do you forget once it's untangled? Uh, if we cast in something permanent, uh, may we remember forever? These are pieces that um, I actually made for an Oxbow edition. Um, and I, was, I began making them um, in Richmond, Virginia at the same time uh, last summer when these massive bronze, bronze Confederate monuments were being dismantled and removed across the city. Among other things, I kept thinking to myself, like, where do these monuments go when they get taken down, you know, um, will they melt them down? And what was the bronze that was made up of these monuments uh, melted down from before? Uh, the notion that the material itself does not change, but its form and what that form symbolizes to others changes really stuck with me. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what happens when we are given the opportunity to reimagine these materials of our past, um, to be used as instruments and tools for our futures, right? So I wanted to take or wanted to make an object um, and a scale to be held uh, so that unlike the intention of these colossal Confederate monuments um, to intimidate and to exclude, one could access that piece through the weight and the feel of the metal in their hand. I also wanted to um, have a form that was instantly recognizable by other Black people um, as well as a tool, as a part of our self-care and language, as a gesture of solidarity. Um, so three in one is a multi-use comb casted in Richmond um, reclaimed bronze. And assumes the material potentials history within the Confederate monuments and reimagines it as a symbol of pride and reflection and renewal. Um, and, and to just give you a little bit about where I'm working right now in my studio and um, the work that I've just currently made, um, I am continuing to investigate these materials and alongside uh, their, their sort of parallel conversations with um, steel and iron. And right now, cocoa butter has gotten a lot of my attention. Um, cocoa butter is a solid edible fat that's extracted from cocoa bean. It's rich in antioxidants and it's renowned for healing properties. And for me, cocoa butter, um, it carries a material metaphor of healing and labor. Um, and in particular, the ritualistic labor of self-care. Um, at an early age, I was introduced to it as a material for self-healing, right? Like I was taught to rub it into my skin, to replenish the skin and disappear scars, right? Almost quite, kind of like magic. Holding, um, <clears throat> holding your name like butter in your palm is an installation that pays homage and prosperous healing uh, for the personal and collective trauma caused by deaths from COVID-19 and the killings by the hands of police in the first year of the coronavirus pandemic. On view at Sculpture Center, I wanted to find a way to um, speak through my practice this experience of a compounding loss, um, uh, this experience of, of mourning, um, a, a multiple mourning that uh, sort of uh, piles on top of itself, right? Um, this experience of like loss and grief and as well as to speak to this unending process of, of healing. Um, I could probably talk to you for another day about this work, but I'm gonna instead um, just leave you with these questions that I think are really beautifully asked by the curator of this in practice exhibition, um, Catherine Simone Reynolds. Uh, and she, uh, she asks, how can we navigate the unending notions of process and procession through a softer lens? 
what would it look like for us to move toward non or move not toward resolution, but towards a constant, comfortably unresolved state? What if there is no such thing as closure? And with that, I'm gonna um, sling this over to Devin so that she can introduce you to their work. Thank you, Abigail. I love your work. I love that show too. And I was so excited to see your work in that space because I've seen like, as soon as I saw pictures of that space, I was like, oh my God, I've seen so many great artists that I love like in that basement kind of space. I really wish that I could visit it. And that is a huge deal and congrats. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. We practiced. <laughs> okay, you see screen you presents. Okay, hello, I'm Devin. Um, so I primarily work with steel. Um, and I, I like to treat it as a drawing material. Um, I like that style of working. Um, I like how it can hold its weight visually as a sculpture that changes and morphs as you walk around it. And at the same time, it acts as a drawing that can be projected on its surroundings or projected like in a space, in an indoor space or projected against, ideally, I love it when it's kind of against the work of my friends or in kind of like a group exhibition setting. Um, and all the, all the things that you see, if you can imagine, they're, they're totally flat from the side. So they really are just like these flat um, drawings. And um, a lot of the work I've made in the last few years was about imagining the natural world almost as if it were its own separate dimension and kind of thinking about the ways that it glitches or like leaps into the human one um, and what kind of like man-made portals are available for that transference. and. Hence the snake comes out of the mailbox, like <laughs> things kind of ending up where they don't belong or nature behaving badly. Um, I also, I like to think a lot about the pretty simple idea that if you go outside, you will see something or things will happen. Um, if you just go for a walk, you, like no matter what you see, things. <laughs> um, uh, and so something like this, like, which I didn't actually see, but um, the idea of like a serendipitous moment where unbeknownst to the snake, it's become a rope and it's like tied up this stick against a rock. Um, just one of those weird moments that surely has happened at some point um, somewhere. Um, the work on the left, uh, kind of more references a little more literally the like other dimensional or portal um theories surrounding bigfoot sightings and this was made in reference to like a 16 millimeter film strip um referencing the patterson gimlin film which is the most famous um account like the most famous footage of bigfoot that exists um i think it's real <laughs> uh on the right is a work called trophy um and it was made as a bit of a nod to like taxidermy and like teasing out the aesthetic value of animals, like both alive and dead and as like decoration. Um, and a lot of the times the way I work is from like a long stream of drawing sessions and often a particular doodle will just like really get me going and I'll try to just make it um, in steel before I really have a chance to second guess myself. Um, so my, my working model for a while was like the sillier, the better kind of. And I liked that my kind of doodle brain could be rendered in this like hard forever material um, and, and maybe be, and force me to take like small ideas a little more seriously and spend like slower time with them. And then to get to like see them and play with them in space in a relationship to each other. Um, it all kind of just goes back to sketching and doodling. Um, this tiger 
um, sculpture was looking to a friend's mind as that portal. Um, she was at a residency with me and she was like a really like an expert on tigers, um, writes about them. And I asked her one night to draw one from memory at dinner <laughs> without looking. And this like drawing resulted and it was one of those really kind of fun residency collaborations where like a late night threat to make the thing um, actually comes true. <laughs> So I made her drawing and she wrote a little something about it also, which I'm sorry, I don't have. Um, but okay, so this work was kind of getting more into, this is this like is a reflection of a little more of the way that I'm working now. Um, but this was a little a series that I made that was like a series that was repeating abstracted faces that are set atop a chunk of main slate, um, which was like local to the area of where I was at in this residency. Um, and the process for this work and a few others like it was to take a photo of a rock and then send it into Illustrator um, and use the trace function on Illustrator, which totally breaks down some, the, the, the photo into lines, um, makes it pretty unrecognizable. And then zooming way in and searching those lines for something that resembled a face and then making a few drawings from that and then ultimately like rendering it in steel. So it's a really roundabout way of getting at the phenomenon of pareidolia, which is like the tendency of people to perceive human features on inanimate objects and to, um, yeah, to just like the, always looking for faces in the clouds, um, faces in leaves, faces in rocks. Uh, and another example here of that work, which is shown brilliantly alongside my amazing friend and coworker, Dove, um, their murals are on the wall and I have these two steel pieces here on the floor. Um, the one on the right says catfish, both upside down and right side up. And it's bunched together in a form that kind of resembles like a wrinkly old boulder. And then the piece on the left is like the same method of like deciphering faces from like digitally rendered over and over again um, rocks. Um, and this is like the most exciting that I could be or the most excited that I could, that I have felt, you know, about my work is when it is like put in relationship to my friends. And I think that this show like really showed me that like, I don't, I, I'm not, convinced that my work is finished <laughs> these days until it's actually like in conversation with somebody else um, visually like this. So this was really fun to do with them. Um, okay, so now we're at 2020 and I'm gonna try to like make this like long story as short as possible. Cause I know that it's like, it's very, it's like all too relatable that like in the, in that year I really had no drive to like make my work or what I thought it was. I was just like, I, yeah, I just didn't make art in that year for most of it. Um, I was pretty down about it, but I turned to a very trusty old coping mechanism of mine, which was walking the beach alone and picking things up off the ground. <laughs> um, and the, like, you should see my shark tooth collection from like being an only child in Florida and going on like these like, shitty vacations with like my mixed step family and just like piecing out and like dissociating along the beach. And I have, I have so many shark teeth like from that, from that time. So anyway, okay, this story is already too long. But so this summer um, I realized that I've always had this like very superficial interest in rocks and shells and fossils. So it's been a thing where I'm like picking them up. I've always had collections of them, but it really hit me this year, like how wild it is that I don't, that I know almost none of their names um, or how they form or their stories. And I swear I came home from like just one particular day of looking at the rocks here at Lake Michigan, which are spectacular. And I was like, I'm going to start pretending to be a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know like how much I can actually like cram into my 32 year old brain, but I'm gonna like do my best to just like really try to learn. Um, and that really just consumed the whole rest of my summer and fall last year and up until this very moment. Um, and I've, I've nearly finished a book actually about 
15 of the rocks that are found in this region. So that's something to look forward to, but I don't, um, I'm gonna keep that close to my chest for now, but at, this is like the level we're at. I'm like, I wrote a book about rocks. <laughs> Um, so I was really lucky to have a residency for three months in Chattanooga this winter and I got to sit in this like empty studio and confront this huge hiatus of art making that I just had and like figure out what was going to make me excited about making work again and I was like well what if all that I give a fuck about right now is like rocks <laughs> and geology um, and so I'm contending with the fact that that, that it's you know, it's one thing to like be interested in a science and it's totally another thing to be a, a scientist. And where do I fit and how do I hop between these languages that I'm like trying to cram in? And I begin just like drawing a lot from um, diagrams and reading scientific papers that were way over my head and watching tons of documentaries. And all along, I'm like amassing this idea of what it looks like to like what a scientist looks like and what doing science looks like and what, but more than that, I was starting to get really interested in what it looks like to learn and what is like performing learning and what are the tools that you need um, to learn. So th th I'm just gonna kind of scroll through some work because all of these things are unfinished. I still have a lot that I wanna add to them, um, but this is just kind of getting at this, the most recent work that I've made. So. So yeah, so what are, what are the tools that you need to learn? Like if you mark the pages of the books with the little post-it tabs, like what have you calcified there? Like when you like tag or label something for um, that you found, you know, like you're, you're setting this thing in motion where you're just like, you're doing the process and you're, try, you're hoping that something will come out the other side. Um, when you pull out the magnifying glass and you like look at the rock, like what do you see? <laughs> um, so with that, yeah, I'm showing this new work. I think that, I, I don't have much more to say about it. I think that we'll have like questions for each other and that'll open up some more talking points, but I'll say that it's like been very invigorating to get into a side of myself that I think has always been pretty latent. I've always been interested in like earth processes I've always taken comfort in like deep time and our simultaneous like big and smallness. I've always loved keeping the humor in my work and sort of poking fun at myself through this process. Like, oh, now you're serious. Like you're like, look at you with your book about rocks and like your car full of rocks and your tiny magnifier. Like, aren't you just the little science? <laughs> um, but yeah, learning is really clumsy work. And I think this is like been the year of like the amateur for a lot of people that I know. Um, a lot of folks who just got really into like self-teaching and like diving deep into like something that's been like a light interest and really going for it. Um, yeah, I just think that that's really exciting stuff. Um, but this is just the current view of my studio. It's like some wild, there's, I'm entering the third dimension here, which is crazy. This is three days ago, I entered the third dimension. So I'm going, <laughs> I'm taking myself out of the flat drawing mode, maybe um, sneaking into there. So yeah, we'll see where this work goes. This is my table of rocks. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd be happy if any of y'all are like in Michigan this summer, I'd be happy to take you to the beach and show you what's what out there. It's really incredible. And there's like some of the oldest rocks in the world are out there. It's really cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good summation of like where I'm at right now. And I would love to like talk to you, Abigail, about some questions that we had for each other. Um, awesome. Okay, thanks. Um, my first question is, how do you feel about the rock? I feel really good about them. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I have like, we, um, so we prepared a couple questions for each other, but we might just kind of like go out and in and then we'll leave some room for sure for um, other questions that there might be. But um, my, que my, my first question for you, Devin, is um there's there's this 
locational, there's this locational narrative that's like embedded in both of our works, right? So when I think of how your work functions, sometimes they almost feel like they could be characters or still moments in a story, um, a story that's like so heavily influenced by the backdrop of Florida, right? And so you talked a little bit about that experience of like walking and um, this sort of like isolation in Florida. Um, and we both know when we're talking about Florida, we're not talking about this like spring break bike week kind of Florida, right? We're talking about this like somewhere between suburbs and swamp-like magic type of Florida, right? Like that we know really well. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this locational meeting to you, but maybe more so in the space of like, how how has that changed over time? You know, like from the space of like being um, like shark tooth queen <laughs> to like now, right? And like, um, and like, what does it feel like when you go back to Florida now? Yeah, um, I, first of all, this is like the longest that I've ever gone without going back. So there's that. It's complicated because when I go back, I don't go back to like the house I grew up in or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Same. So, so I, but I still find myself like going back to the places that I knew well and, and the places that I remember having like the most joy and just like 99% of them are out in nature and like hikes that I remember going on and like springs that I remember going to. So I always have this like, my mindset of just like being the tourist that just like goes back to the, back to the places. But yeah, they always feel different than I remember. There's always like a, a new like strip mall right there. You know, like they just can't stop building things down there. It seems like building public <laughs> complexes. Um, Public thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I the the impulse is there to like yeah just like absorb the nature and the good memories that I have from there and then to just like keep collecting things mm -hmm. whenever mm -hmm. I come back it just feels really right to go straight to the ocean and but yeah as far that that imagery is like leaving me so because right. I. Like, what do I, what do I have to say about, like, I don't really know Florida anymore. So I think that that, I'm trying to take that impulse that I learned down there and that formed down there. It's, it's interesting to be up here because it is a beach culture in Saga type, but it's like completely, totally. really different, but people, I don't know. Yeah. There's still just like this raging desire to like be at the water and there's so many people who are into what I'm into like so many fellow rock hounds out there but it's all just like <laughs> rock hounds <laughs> <with their buckets. laughs> but I have the secret beach like I know where nobody goes <laughs> um yeah I hope that answers your question can I can we volley can I ask you a question now I would love that yeah let's go cool um so I wanted to know, I'll ask this one for what, what are some things that viewers that they don't see when they look at your work or that they might not see when they look at your work? Like something that's hidden either on purpose or things that are embedded that require more careful looking or things that you embed just for you. Mm -hmm. Share. That. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think I talked a bit, a little bit about these things because I think I think maybe um, there can be this sort of like aesthetic disguise that my work can kind of take on that, you know, where um, actually I feel like I have these like small narratives and like every like little moment that's happening, like um, it can be really difficult for me to talk about my work quickly with people because of that, you know, like there's something that I, I think like I'm, I, I, I work in like two different ways, which is like one that can be like really responsive um, to what's directly sort of happening in like a process. And then the other one can be sort of like meditative. Like, I don't know why I'm working towards this, um, this sort of, I don't know, this shape or the symbol, but through a process of um, working on it, it feels like it can kind of like 
lead to a, a narrative or I sort of like discover in itself, right? And so I feel like, um, I feel like those like, there are these like, these gems of thought that I, that I'm thinking about a lot when I'm making a work, but might not necessarily be on like the surface of that. And those are like, sort of like the, the Sankovas, right? This like space of like mythology that I'm really interested in, right? And like, um, I guess something that I think um, maybe like isn't known from people who don't know me directly is that I was raised in um, like a really religious family. Um, my, my father was a pastor, my grandfather, my uncles, my, my great grand my ancestors are voodoo priests, you know, and so there's this like space of, um, of, of like belief and like in mythology that I'm, I'm like really interested in sort of like, um, of, of like complicating and like highlighting its complication through these like kind of like desperate hope moments that I feel like I have, you know, like I, I feel like in, in some ways I'm sort of like wishing for things to happen through the work, you know, um, or, or sort of like implying that they could. Um, and, and maybe that's something that you'd have to really be in tune with like me to, to really see that type of like, um, gesture I guess but I don't know maybe not maybe it's totally seen I'm not sure but um yeah <laughs> cool um I'm gonna I'm gonna take it I'm gonna take it now and I want to ask you a sort of like fun question um but I think about like um I mean for as long as I've known you you're have had this like really like if anyone knows Devin they know that they have this like incredible like craft like in precision like if you've seen Devin in the studio like they, if that like thing isn't bent to like the exact like angle, like they're gonna sit there for hours until they get that like one little <laughs> angle done. So it's like, it's like, it's so, it's it's amazing, you know? Um, I mean, like I call Devin like my metal sensei, right? So like, um, I wonder like if you could switch Freaky Friday style with any craft for a day and for 24 hours you're like an expert in that craft or it could be like a material or a process um what what would it be thank you for asking um i've been watching so much drag race yes, this is me too. Out, and thank you, thank you michael quadrado for your password for wow presents plus because i can also watch drag race now in like every country too there and so so yeah, watching lots of that, I get very envious of like, and I've always been like loosely interested. I love costumes and like I was born on Halloween. So I've always like loved costumes and dressing up and like dabbling in that. And Oxbow gives us a great chance to like dabble in costumery. Um, but I think that if I could just like wake up and I am the expert, I think that I would want to be just like a really sick, like fashion designer and like today's the show and putting all the things together and I've got the microphone and like I'm tailoring and tweaking things and then it's like go 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 um <laughs> yeah just having a really cool like sense of style myself would be nice um yeah I admire fashion industry shout out to JG for being so good at sewing and <laughs> <laughs> I really admire just people that can like take a pattern and like I damn I like I want to make my own clothes too like there's so many things yeah. that I know that I want that I can't find so mm -hmm. I'm yeah. definitely the queen that is like hot gluing in mm -hmm. the room <laughs> like the one who's like I I've never put this together even though it's like small so like I could do small sewing things but no there's like Oh my gosh, yeah, we have to talk. I didn't know, we always do this where we're watching the same thing um, at the moment, but like, I guess everyone's watching Drag Race, so it doesn't really matter. If they're not like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna need that free password because I'm like making up emails right now to get VH1 for free right now, so. Um... Yeah, I see Michael nodding, so yes. Um, <laughs> what's your answer to that question? What would you want a Freaky Friday? Um, I think I would want to, um, well, now that you put that on the table, well, you know, I have like, I would really love to do to to neon 
make blow whatever for like 24 hours you know like make all of the signs of my dreams um for for whatever um but also there's just like so much like expertise and like um I don't know it's like it's like a like a science craft I think that or that's how I think of it and like this is how you can tell it I don't know anything about it um but like I think it's amazing and I would love to be able to like have that type of confidence I think with any sort of like uh glass blowing pro like processes like you know it's like there's also this like chillness about it that I feel like everyone you kind of have to have this like mentality that is like I'm here and I'm present but I'm I'm like I'm not stressing about it you know and like I I love that because um that's not always me in the studio <laughs> you know like so I I, I admire that Hopefully I can sneak you into the glass blowing studio at least for a day since you're here for kind of a longer time yeah. when you get here this summer. We, we can, can freak you Friday for 24 hours. It's yeah. anything but chill. It's the hottest process I've ever done in my life. I can't <laughs> it's scary how hot it, everything is in here. Um, okay. I have more questions for you. Um, let's read yours. So we're both interested in materials. We're like definitely material nerds. And I think lately we were, we've both been interested in like more of their histories. Like, what is this thing? Where does it come from? Um, which comes with a good amount of research and going down lots of internet rabbit holes and lots of looking for just the right like thing to read or just the right like person who has the same like mixed interests. Um, so, okay, well, what is, what is the strategy with all of that happening? Like, what is the strategy you have for letting what you're consuming or like putting into your brain? Um, how do you make sure that, or how do you let it come out the other side in your work? Um, and how do you like language hop between everything that you're encountering, like scientific knowledge and personal knowledge and like art history? What What is your like, how do you, do you have a strategy for translating that or, Maybe do you just hope that yeah. information takes over? <laughs> um, you know, I think some sometimes it's like about a space of like gathering a lot of knowledge, whether it's true or not, right? And like um, sort of like sitting on that and like meditating on it for a while. And like, that might be like a sort of like non-active meditation. It might be something that's like, okay, I put this in my sort of like library of understanding and I don't even touch it for like three years, you know, like, and all of a sudden it's sort of like that, that information sort of resurfaces or it like connects together in some sort of strange way because I've kind of given it time to like nurture and other sort of thoughts or understandings, you know? Um, but I think what's important to me is like making sure that I, I mean, there's a space of like truth in, in the work when it comes to research that I've kind of like, you, you know, especially when it comes to sort of like ancestral or like cultural research, these like stories like that are like so good. Sometimes they're just like, it's like, is it true or is it not, you know? And like, does it, does it matter? You know, like if, if it's believed in or if it's um, sort of like has this space of, um, I don't know, that it has like some sort of like moral lesson, you know, like I feel like it still has this validity that I can work with. And so, but I don't know. So there's this like sort of, um, when I think about research, I'm thinking about, um, I don't know, I'm thinking about like both myself as like an instructor and an artist, you know? And so I use like my role in education a lot of the times to um, sort of like suss out information that might be historical in this way that's not necessarily needs to be made into work of mine, you know, but can sort of create a context, you know, so there, there, there are boundaries and like spaces that I just, I really like to let things bleed, you know, and like sometimes it's about sort of, um, sort of filtering that or like straining that to like allow those spaces to be separate yet still have a conversation with each other. So I know that um, um, that uh, 
in the chat, they asked if, it, if anyone has an interest in like asking us a question, you're more than welcome to. I think me and Devin could ask each other questions for like the rest of the day. Um, I don't know how long y'all's lunch breaks are, but um, if you do have a question, then I think maybe we can throw it to them. If not, we can wait. I mean, yeah, like I said, we could, we could keep going for a long time, so. Hmm. I have a question. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you both probably know this by now, but I've been a huge fan of both of your works uh, even before I came to Oxbow and um, knew about Oxbow, started working here. Um, and when I found out you were such good friends, I was like, that makes complete sense. Um, but I really gravitated towards both of your works when I was in grad school, kind of straying away from more traditional printmaking processes and starting to work more sculpturally and with more materials. But I'm curious um, how you both view the role of play in your, in your work and in your sort of process in this while working in the studio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can take that one first, D. Um, I just like, um, <clears throat> I've recognized that like, um, so, so for me, I mean, a big part of my introduction to, to working with metal in the first place was like, I was like hiding from, <laughs> I was hiding from my department in Devin's office downstairs. <laughs> and, and um, uh, I, I um in, in my like flea from printmaking, or I'm gonna call it that it. Um, but I and so I started working with Devin in these ways of like, hey, like, what do you think? Or like, do you think I could turn this sketch into this like metal sculpture? And she, like, the first thing I think she told me was like, she was like, Well, I mean, I can do that for you, or like I can just teach you how to do it and then you can just keep going. And like that sort of like entered a space of like metalworking for me really. Um, and so play has been a huge way of the way that I think about actually coming up with like forms. I, I, um, I had like one of my first sculpture teachers, she, um, she made these like really beautiful, like intricate molds. And um, she was also this like really precision based like illustrator. And so she, she the only way that she would make what? a sculpture the only way she would make a sculpture is if she couldn't um, draw it. And so I've really thought about that as like a way of like, um, when I like enter um, a shop to to make with um, with metal, a lot of that is coming off, um, off the page when, as far as like where I actually expect to go. Um, and so there's this really like playful experience with me um, just kind of yep. like rolling with what's happening, you know, I'm like, oh, this is five inches too short. I guess it's gonna bend this way and go like that and pretend to meet something else. Um, and that's sort of like this sort of um, new life of like sort of direct drawing and, and the way that I see play in, in my work. Yeah, I think, I think my, my, the fun for me, well, I love, Mm. <laughs> okay, so what Abigail was saying about me being a total like maniac control freak um, robot when the shop is true. There's literally like, <laughs> I don't give myself a lot of wiggle room when I'm actually working with the material. I tend to work like from a projected drawing like onto paper and then I trace directly like on the paper with the metal and weld it right there in place to be an exact rendering of that drawing but the fact that the drawing is normally and I've been trying to like make things a little bit looser and like a little more wiggly the fact that the drawing is based on an actual just like doodle where I was just like freestyling in my sketchbook and I just like picked something I think that the the play is like on the front end in that process like drawing and then on the back end whenever I have the thing then I can get excited about like you know like what can I hang on it what can I suspend inside of it like lately I've been working a little bit with like magnets to keep things a little more flexible like um and using them as kind of a collage material that wasn't really evident in any of the like photos I showed um but I I am like trying to branch out of just the black lines and really add things to my work so yeah treating creating a framework where I can play but in my mind like I need to follow the rules like for at least a chunk in the middle and like stay focused so that I can have the thing to have fun with. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay I have a question. Um, 
I don't know how to phrase this correctly, so I'm just gonna like say it. Um, I was I read this quote that was saying, if you like, as a non-white person within art history, if you know if you reference art history, um, if your if art history pulls you, if you pull art history, or if you like coexist with art history, like I guess like Western stuff and I'm curious um like you know your thoughts on that either of you can answer this question just like how do you like I just have like um a hard time trying to decipher what parts of art history I like decide to choose from and if like uh, choosing if like what I'm picking is like um like if it's creating a, a problem or if it's like, you know, solving a problem or if it's just like having like a conversation with, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Hmm. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'm gonna defer to Abigail for this question. Um, yeah, cause I had a painting of a white lady and a painting of butter um, and I'm, they're like totally different, um, but I, you know, I think I th I think about um, none of my students are in this room. Sometimes I don't think that <laughs> it really matters <laughs> to be referencing like um, these sort of like what the uh, sort of like colloquial like art history really like is because I feel like for me there's like a process, a constant process of like unlearning the things that I've been taught in, in school, whether that be through like, whether that because it's a Western lens, right? But I'm, I'm always like, um, I'm, I'm also curious about like, looking at a painting, what I might see in that painting, or what I'm paying attention to in that painting versus what's actually being sort of like taught in that space, you know, like, um, I'm, I'm curious about that because I think that it sort of puts this new sort of perspective on like what, um, like why are we sort of like um, just sort of um, intaking what we're being fed without a sort of question, right? Um, I'm also really, I, like definitely in this moment in my life, I'm kind of sick of being put in context to everything, you know, like I'm sort of like over this fact of like, let's talk about Western art history or like, let's talk about outside of this gaze, like instead of like, instead of thinking about this gaze as being the thing that we're sort of like in control of or always constantly in context to, I'm curious about sort of just like ignoring it, you know, and being like, this is a new, like, fuck the gaze, you know, fuck the lens, not the gaze, love the gaze, <laughs> <laughs> sort of G-A-Z-E, right? Like, um, and, and like move towards a space of, um, how do we move towards a space where we're in context with ourselves? You know, um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that, but I, I think a lot of the times, like, you know, there, it's also sort of embedded in like the accolades that like people love to talk to when it comes to like um, an artist's like background, you know, it's like where they studied and the institutions that have made them sort of like whatever, you know, like, um, but I, or esteemed, right? Like I, I think it's, um, I'm, I'm really interested in what happens when we sort of like break down that space of putting our work and ourselves in context with um, these these other institutions that we're not we're, we're we're always trying to sort of break from. Why can't we sort of exist separately because we do, you know? Yeah, I mean, especially when it comes to like, don't even get I me mean, started on the canon of like steel sculpture yeah. art. <laughs> and artists and that whole history that I think people come to the metal shop with you know when they come to a class like ours and I think that we definitely take it upon ourselves to like not even mention like I honestly can't even think of one of their names right now <laughs> I can't even <laughs> <laughs> it's the guy that makes the huge stuff that kills people when it falls on them um I think that we try to like bring yeah bring a lighter um just atmosphere to the artists that we talk about whenever we're like because people yeah people just have ideas about like what metal art looks like and it's made by a white guy and you know like Ava Hesse used metal and just <laughs> try to you know start from 
that standpoint and yeah just it's a hard thing to come up against that whole like framework for what metal art should or has historically looked like but i think there's lots of art the artists right now that are working in really exciting ways and i've gotten much more of a thrill of like looking at like my peers work than i have of, of anything of art history really in a while <laughs> But there's surprises and yeah there's plenty that we weren't shown or taught and like it's disappointing i want my money back <laughs> jay were you gonna ask a question i do have a question i'm over here giggling because I, I forgot to put myself back on mute um so y'all are teaching this class together um and that just makes me like think about potential for collaboration or like i guess I have like several questions you can choose to answer one, none or some. Um, have you ever collaborated directly on work? Um, do you, I guess, how do you guys feel about the, the collaborative space of like teaching? Um, mm. And or if you were to make some sort of uh, monster baby out of your two practices, what might that look like? Oh, got pregnant right there thinking about <laughs> monster babies. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and this can be, oh, bye y'all. Um, I think, I don't know. I feel like maybe we've made some like little tiny things together or something. Do, are you thinking of something? For everybody to dance in at the party when you... Oh. Yeah, yeah, we made a dance cage one. Um, that was really great. Things we collaborated on nice screen printed sketchbooks for our students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, every time we're like together in the same working space, I think we're instantly just like, oh, what if we do this or that? Like, I think that we're we've never had. I mean, it's basically like we've never had a show together, but mm -hmm. that would feel that that would be the most fun. I think to to make that happen one day that's like the dream I, I guess that's our that would be a nice baby to have <laughs> yeah I think there's like um you know there's like uh this space of I think teaching together I think we both I mean we're we're we just have different personalities you know I think for me I really appreciate this space of like um I I think Devin like slows me down a little bit in this way of like looking and listening you know like um when it comes to teaching and so I really appreciate that experience and so when I feel like when we're teaching together it's sort of like there's actually like um there could be like a lot of quiet time uh, surprisingly even though we both kind of like to like chat with people like it can be kind of a really quiet experience where we're sort of just like thinking you know and like thinking with our hands and like figuring things out and I um I'm I don't I mean I feel like if we were to have like a monster baby there would be like a lot of sort of like you know the the metal leads there and then, you know like these like weird <laughs> moments but um yeah I, I um I, I feel like that sort of that collaboration has been or that teaching collaboration has been a lot of like um learning from each other too, you know, and like sort of, um, yeah, the, the sort of like constant sort of, not just back and forth, but like existing in the same time, you know, so. Yeah, we had so much fun. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm jelly. I feel like this is a perfect time to like also end because I know we've been here for a while. Um, I really appreciate y'all hosting us mm -hmm. um, and coming to to this time. I know we've lost a lot of people, but y'all the real ones. No, I'm just kidding. Uh <laughs> Thank you all so much. It was so lovely to hear about both of your individual practices and some inspiration and like depth to the work. So I really appreciate you all sharing with us today. There's one question we didn't get to ask though. I was curious about what your favorite toast was for Toast Tuesday. <laughs> hmm. um, okay, I feel like I have like a bougie, I've actually got time to make toast toast and then like <laughs> a, 
a to like I got a grab run toast and like my bougie I, I gotta I like have time I'm like going like for the works I'm going like bread is the most important part the foundation I need like a really good um probably my favorite is like this like um the sesame like crusted bread that's like really fresh and soft um that with like some vegan cream cheese and some tomato avocado um sometimes it'll be like and then it's kind of like what sauerkraut I love that like kimchi or something like that that's like my jam and then if I'm running (laughs) I really like um I really just like um I really like butter and honey on toast that's like my, my like simple cool let's go we done Awesome. Thank you, Abigail. That sounds lovely. I've never thought about kimchi or sauerkraut on toast, but I'll have to try that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you, Devin? Um, yeah, I will famously drive just to get the right bread just for just for one piece of toast. I'll, <laughs> I'll go to the store just because I'm like, okay, this, I'm going to do it right. Um, so definitely sourdough is a favorite, soft, like toasted but not like too hard like still so, like I like to bl- heat blast it you know like turn it all the way up and not leave it in for too long so the outside is, gets really crisp fast but the inside has time to stay soft um <laughs> nut- butter nutritional yeast mm-hmm. black pepper cracked on it this is like my toast bar um and then maybe a little bit of hot sauce and I'll taste it and if the bread's not salty enough like a little bit of salt probably Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing your toast. I actually have a friend delivering a loaf of sourdough in like 20 minutes. So that should be tasty. (laughs) Thank you all for tuning in today for our Toast Tuesday. Our next one is May 11th. And we're really excited that we'll be with Michael Quadrado um, from our staff. I'm going to drop a link for our Samson Club membership in the chat. In case you aren't a member, the first couple of our Toast Tuesday talks are open to the public, but it is a program that is specifically for our members as some of that exclusive content. So if you're not a member and you want to get some Ox perks, definitely check out that link that I just dropped. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. Cheers. Love you guys. Love you too. See you soon.